I want to invite you this morning to open your Bibles to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. And if you're there, I don't have the page number in, uh, in my notes, but it's in your pew Bible towards the back of your book, 1 Peter chapter 5. Towards the end of verse 5, the Bible says, God opposes the proud, but shows favor to the humble. And then in verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of sufferings. And the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, after you have suffered a little while, will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray together. Gracious God in heaven, I know you see, and I know you have our best interest in heart. I know you see everything that's going on, the good, the bad, and everything in between. Thank you, Father, for being ever watchful over your creation. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now to have a God who sees means that we have a God who cares. Let me just share with you a few verses of Scripture about how God sees all things. God sees what we do. For example, in Psalm 33, verses 13 through 15, the Bible says, The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. We have an all-seeing God, and he is always seeing the writer of the book of Hebrews picks up this same thought in Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13, where he says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him who we must give an account. Now, I've got to be honest with you. To know that we have an all-seeing God is, is a very comforting thought, but I've got to tell you, it's a very scary thought as well. God sees how I treat others. God sees the movies I watch. God sees the websites I cl uh, click on. God sees everything. Nothing is hidden from the eyes of God. He sees what we do, but he also sees what we do not see. Remember, where God is enthroned. He is ruling and reigning, sitting enthroned over all of creation. This points to his sovereignty. He sees everything differently than we do. He has what I would call a press box view of his creation. Because of where he is positioned, he has a different perspective than we do often. For example, he doesn't just see our obedience or disobedience. He sees the motives of our hearts, why we do what we do. Jeremiah 17.10 declares, I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind. God looks into our very souls and he can see our motivation. The writer of Proverbs, Proverbs 21, Every man, every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord 
weighs the heart. Even when we feel like we're doing the right thing, sometimes our motives are impure and God sees right into our, our very hearts. Uh, everyone remembers the choosing of David as king. You remember Samuel was called to anoint the next king of Israel, uh, God having rejected Saul. And so Jesse brings all of his sons in, into uh, Samuel's presence, and the first to come across is Eliab. And, and Samuel actually is quite impressed with Eliab. Uh, he is tall and handsome, uh, looks like he'd be a good king, but God was not impressed. Again, he sees the things we don't see. 1 Samuel chapter 16 and verse 7 but the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. God sees all the pieces in play. He sees what will bring us harm. He sees what will bring him the most glory. He sees the cause and effect of every choice we make before we even make it, as well as everyone else walking the earth. God sees what we do not see. Our vision is limited, but God's is not. Uh, John Piper quoted this, God is always doing 10,000 things in your life, and you may be aware of just three of them. God sees everything. He has a press box view of your life. He sees the beginning, he sees the end, and he sees everything in the middle. God sees all things. Uh, one of the names uh, of God in the Bible is El Roi, which means the God who sees. And it's interesting who that name came from. Originally, it was Hagar, the handmaiden, the cast-out handmaiden of Abraham's wife, Sarah, that first called God el Rohi. In her despair, feeling rejected and alone, as she wept, God revealed himself to her. el Rohi, she claimed, God sees me. And I want you to know this morning, God sees every one of you. He knows everything that's going on in your life. Even the things that you're not aware of, God's aware. He sees you. You may forget that He sees. You may not feel like He is aware. But the God that keeps over us always is on the job. The psalmist said, He neither slumbers nor sleeps. God never tires. He never goes to sleep. He's always on the job, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, 366 on leap year. He is always on the job. When you sleep, he's awake, and he's keeping his eye on you. To have a God who sees, then, means that we have a God who cares. God cares for you. Interestingly, God cares for the seemingly unimportant things in life. God's interested in his creation, all of his creation. He's interested in the birds of the air, and he's interested even in the grass of the field. You know, uh, every week we've got uh, Phil Pruitt comes out and mows the grass, and, and a lot of people don't even know he's out there mowing the grass, but God sees every blade of grass you cut, brother. He's watching every move. And we appreciate all that you guys do for the Lord. But God's even interested in, in the grass of the field and the birds of the air. I mean, birds are everywhere. How often do you really give consideration to them? Our Lord Jesus uh, was interested in the things of this world, the seemingly unimportant. He said in Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34, I'm going to read this from the contemporary English version. I tell you not to worry about your life. Don't worry about having something to eat, drink, or wear. Isn't life more than food or clothing? 
Look at the birds in the sky. They don't plant or harvest. They don't even store grains in barns. Yet your Father in heaven takes care of them. Aren't you worth more than birds? He goes on in verse 27. Can worry make you live any longer? Now, let me just park right there for a minute. How many worry warts do we have in here? Uh, your life's not getting any longer because you're worrying all the time. Worrying about what's going to happen, what happened last week, what happens today, what's going to happen next month, and you worry, worry, worry. Actually, it can shorten your life. It certainly can't add any length to it. Why worry about clothes? Look how the wildflowers grow. They don't work hard to make their clothes. But I tell you that Solomon, with all his wealth, wasn't as well clothed as one of them. God gives such beauty to everything that grows in the field, even though it is here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow. He will surely do even more for you. Why do you have such little faith? He goes on in verse 31. Don't worry and ask yourselves, will we have something to eat? Will we have anything to drink? Will we have any clothes to wear? Only people who don't know God are always worrying about such things. Your Father in heaven knows what you need, and He knows all your needs. But more than anything else, put God's work first and do what He wants. Then the other things will be yours as well. Don't worry about tomorrow. It will take care of itself. You have enough worry about today. I, I remember memorizing uh, verse 33 seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you what do we need to put first uh, what we're worried about no put God first he'll take care of all the rest he's interesting interested in those things that are seemingly unimportant the little things in life He's even interested in dying birds and hair follicles. Listen to Jesus again in Matthew chapter 10. Aren't two sparrows sold for only a penny? But your father knows when any one of them falls to the ground. Even the hairs on your head are counted. So don't be afraid. You are worth much more than many sparrows. One of my favorite songs of all times is His Eye is on the Sparrow. I love to hear that song sung, and I love the words. Listen closely. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my portion. A constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. And I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. You know, nobody cares for you and nobody cares for me like Jesus. You know how I know that? Can you count the hairs on my head? Even my closest companion in life doesn't know how many hairs I have on my head. But some of you, it's a little easier to count than <laughs> others. But Jesus knows. Even the numbers of follicles I have on my head. Nobody, nobody cares for me, cares for you like Jesus. He cares for the seemingly unimportant. He cares for the broken and the weak. It's amazing to me the vision and the sight that God has on the seemingly unimportant things in life. Isaiah wrote in Isaiah chapter 42, 
A bent reed he will not break off, and a dimly burning wick he will not extinguish. He will faithfully bring forth justice. How many times have you been walking through a field of tall grass and, and just reached over and just broke off a piece of grass, put it in your mouth, didn't think nothing about it? God sees even the broken reeds in the grass. He's amazing. Are, are you feeling weak? Or is, are there problems in your life that are piling up and you've been worrying and, and it's kind of sapped your energy and, and you, you're, yeah, you're, your light for Jesus is burning, but it's burning ever so dimly. It's just like a smoldering little wick. You know, you go by at the end of the night when you're putting out the candles and you guys burn candles, don't you? And uh, the wick's just burning down and you just reach over there and put it out not the Lord he'll fan it back into flame are you feeling like that weak wick God sees where you're at right now this morning he cares about the seemingly unimportant things in life he cares about the hungry the thirsty the outcast the sick the needy Matthew 25 31 when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on the right and the goats on the left. You could do this either way, right? He's going to do some separating. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. God is interested in the things that are seemingly unimportant. We're so wrapped up, aren't we, sometimes in our own lives. And all around us, there are people that are in need. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Have you reached out to somebody in need recently? Jesus notices that. He sees that and he accounts it as righteousness. Uh, then he will say to those on his left, oh, I don't want to hear these words. Depart from me, you who are accursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. You know, it's interesting, isn't it, that God sees all things. He cares for the seemingly unimportant, but he calls his people to look after those who are in need. God cares for others through his people. I praise God that this church is a giving church, and we can give him all the glory for that. And I'll tell you, I'm also praising God in advance because our missions 
is going to increase. Our missions giving this year is going to be, it's going to be proposed to you, but it's going to be a proposed increase in our missions giving for 2022. You know, this is a church that recognizes that we are the hands and the feet of God on this earth, that it's through us that he meets the needs of the seemingly unimportant. But God also remembers the forgotten and sees the forgotten. Now, I believe I've shared with this congregation who my favorite Bible character is. Of course, Jesus. But aside from Jesus, who is your favorite Bible character? Anybody? This is the time when you talk back. Job. Who? Job, Job Ruth, Paul, Paul Esther. Esther, Luke, Dr. Luke. Who else? Nobody said David. Wow. How about that? Well, he's not mine either. I mean, I like him. But my favorite Bible character is Aeneas. So who is that? Y'all know who Aeneas is? He's kind of a forgotten character in the Bible. But he's my favorite. You can find him in Acts chapter 9. And he's tucked in between two great saints of the Bible. He's tucked in between Paul, Saul, who became the Apostle Paul, and Tabitha, who was beloved by everyone in her town. Tucked in between there is a fellow by the name of Aeneas. You can find him in Acts chapter 9 and verse 32. And the Bible says, Now as Peter was traveling through all those regions, he also came down to the saints who lived at Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas. There he is who had been bedridden for eight years because he was paralyzed. Now here we've got uh, a seemingly unimportant person uh, by the world standards who, was, who had been bedridden and paralyzed for eight years. And uh, it wasn't as convenient back then as it is now. He was in a little mud hut somewhere stuck in the middle of uh, the Middle East and uh, he had to rely on people to bring him food and clothing. And uh, you can just imagine sometimes even they forgot and days would go by and they'd show up and things were a mess and they had to take care. And then, you know, there's Aeneas suffering all this time, eight years. I don't know at one point uh, Aeneas kind of gave up. Maybe it was a year in or two years in, maybe three Certainly by four or five years, Aeneas just said, you know what, nobody really cares about me. I might as well just curl up and die. Uh, certainly by eight years, he'd given up all hope. But here comes one of God's people, Peter. And he said to Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your own bed. Immediately he got up and all who lived at Lydda and Sharon saw him and they turned to the Lord. Now, Aeneas only gets three verses of Scripture, verses 33 through 35, but he does get three verses, doesn't he? He got three verses of Scripture, and he was a nobody from nowhere. And that's why I identify with him, because you're looking at a nobody from nowhere. Uh, you know, the world's got seven billion people. If I keeled over and died today, there might be a few who would remember me for a little while, but then I would be a distant memory. But Jesus will always remember, care for, and hold me in his arms for all of eternity. Nobody cares for me uh, like Jesus now, you've got a verse of Scripture. Did you know that? You sure do. It's John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Do you remember in Sunday school when we were little kids, it's the, the teacher said, put your name there in John 3, 16. You remember doing that? For God so loved Ebby that he gave his only begotten Son. For God so loved Dan. 
that he gave his only begotten son. Put your name in that scripture. You've got a verse of scripture. Not only does God see, not only does God care, but God acts. From the very beginning of time, God has made provision for his creation. And in the garden, he prepared for us a paradise. No want, no fear, no death. And when we fell from grace, we were naked and ashamed. When the Bible tells us we tried to hide ourselves from God, and in our shame, we attempted to cover our own sin with fig leaves. Fig leaves represent our attempt to cover our own sin, but God's remedy was different. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 21, Then the Lord made clothes out of an animal's skins for the man and his wife. Now the Bible doesn't tell us precisely what animal that was that God fashioned those clothes. God had to kill an animal. Death entered as a result of sin into the world. God had to kill an animal and then skin that animal and then cover those people with those clothes. But many scholars believe that it was a lamb. I'm one of those that believe it was a lamb. For the book of Revelation speaks of the Lamb's book of life and the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And so God took a lamb and he covered our sins. Even in our fallen state, God acted to provide a covering for our sin. He still acts today. He gave us Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And just like fig leaves, any attempt that we make on our own is insufficient. This is God's deal. God saves us by His grace through His Son, through the covering of the blood of His Son. Our sins are washed away and we're made as pure as snow. The Bible is a story about paradise lost and paradise regained through Jesus. Do you know Him today? Do you know the Savior of the world. God sees, God cares, and God acts. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, Peter says, so that He may exalt you at the proper time, having cast all your anxiety on Him, because He cares for you. As I close, let me just share with you very quickly. One of the great mysteries in the universe is that God is even mindful of us. The psalmist wrote, what is man that God is mindful of him? Mystery or not, the scriptures reveal and Jesus proves this undeniable truth. You matter to God. Brother Jay, if you'll pray.